suppose. Though I cannot imagine how it is still possible to spoil anything for this game. Now on to the question on the thumbnail and the title of this video. Was it really that great? Or is it your nostalgia? I don't know, what would you answer to this? Would you read to me? You don't make you feel better. <laughs> I would read the fucking phone book to you if you asked me, dear Anna. Anyway, what I mean is that the answer to the question in the thumbnail and the title of this video should be absolutely obvious to anyone who's part of this little family we've been building over the last two years. And one would think that it'd be universally obvious to anyone who's ever been into computer role-playing games. But it seems like that is not the case. These are some of the comments I shit you not that some people have left on the channel in regards to Baldur's Gate 2. My Gen Z eyes are hurting seeing these graphics. The letters seem so small. Oh my god, the graphics. The characters are so small. So a newcomer's perspective into Baldur's Gate. I tried really hard to get into Baldur's Gate, I really did. Came in with a biased outlook and everything, and I can't say I hate the game, but it wasn't inspired, it wasn't interesting, and the combat is awful. I look at this game, I want to play it, but the graphics are so bad. I really do not understand all the hype. This game isn't that fun. Listen, if you don't like Baldur's Gate 2... I got news for you. That means you're gay. <laughs> what I mean is that it is okay. Hey, different strokes for different folks, eh? couldn't resist playing that song. I got nothing much to say about these opinions, like the song says, they'll have theirs, you'll have yours, and I'll have mine. But there are a few that I actually found, hmm, interesting. And I just couldn't let the opportunity slide to make a video about it. So the Fallout video isn't ready, huh? Yeah, there might be a little bit of that going on too, but that'll be the next video, I promise. So these are the interesting comments I tell you about. I like Kingmaker, but Baldur's Gate 1 seemed way too outdated to be enjoyed without my nerd glasses. I mean, I can appreciate the craft, of course, but immersion is very difficult. You know, letting go and forgetting that you are playing a game at all? Someone rides a nostalgia horse here. The good old, in my days and it used to be better, and all those text memes. In reality, no. It's not that it was better then and now we have garbage, it's different. You look at your beloved game through nostalgia glasses and that's it. And that's it, he declares. Just because you used to love it and modern kids will prefer Baldur's Gate 3 over Baldur's Gate 1, it doesn't mean they're dumb or take worse product or whatever else you might say. And speaking of ideas and concepts that might be out of date in a few years, like Baldur's Gate doesn't have that, like the comparison system or lockpicking mechanic, I mean, our memories are always better than reality when it comes to stuff we like. Of course, it's your choice to keep on the nostalgia glasses, but still the in my days argument is pretty poor. Well, ain't that a spicy one, and we will be breaking it apart soon, and I'm talking break, believe that. And then Lou Luna said, Fallout 2 vs Underrail, which one is better by today's standards? This one is not about Baldur's Gate 2 of course, but I'll still ask that you keep this one in mind, because it'll be important later. And further down that conversation, Lou also said, Oh yeah, and give us your top 5 best games, or the ones that are more enjoyable to you, but without any nostalgia. Nostalgia, nostalgia everywhere. Well, let's talk about this nostalgia and entertainment thing. Mary Spender, of all people, seems to have some pretty strong thoughts on the matter. Nostalgia, a wistful or excessively sentimental yearning for, return to, or of, some past period or irrecoverable condition. Now, I myself was born in 1940, so I fondly remember when my buddies and me, we gathered round the old record player and listened to the very first Big Bopper album. Boy, oh boy, it was swell, and there's been no good music ever since. Am I sensing some mockery here, perhaps? 
Nah, an international pop star on the rise whose YouTube channel you should definitely check out if you're into music would never resort to mockery now, would she? Anyway, it's time for me to make my case. And I'll start by saying that video games are a form of art. A form of art that encompasses music, film, literature, and even architecture and painting. And art is what happens inside your brain when you take it in. I got news for you. I mean the peace. The piece of art, ya dicks. What I mean is that we are humans, we connect the dots, and that means that we often attach our experience with a video game with something else that was important to us at the time we played it. Take this comment for example from user Mithril in our video of the top 10 games from the 70s. This took me back to my youth. Me and a bunch of school friends would go up to my local motorway service station and spend money on video games, around 1979 I suppose. We'd hide our bikes behind the police station and spend all Saturday afternoons up there. We quickly discovered that if you went to the shop and complained that the machine had swallowed your money, you'd get a refund, even when that was not entirely true. And we also found that the Flash Gordon pinball was very easy to rig and get 29 free credits on. Fun times. See. The Flash Gordon pinball machine was nothing to write home about, gameplay-wise, but its value for Mr. Mithril goes way beyond the gaming experience per se. It's like a pitten, you know, one of those metal spikes they use in mountain climbing. In this case, it's nailing down a memory of a time when things were probably easier, happier, perhaps. Hiding the bikes behind the police station and cheating the shopkeeper out of a few quarters is I imagine a nice memory. What I mean is that the nostalgia is strong in this one. And I think that's not a bad thing. Actually, this little anecdote is endearing to me. And I felt like I needed to bring it up because it seems like nostalgia is always presented as something negative that we must absolutely put behind us. But when it comes to old games, and yes, some of you say Baldur's Gate 2 is an old game, I think there's a lot more to some of those timeless classics than just the nostalgia value they might have to some of us. I'd like to bring up the concept of today's standards mentioned by Lou Luna, because the first question that comes to mind when I read this is, whose standards are those? To me there is no question that we've come a long way in the world of video games in the last 20 years, but there is also a lot that has become lost to us. I played Baldur's Gate 2 recently for the third time in my life, and I must have said, holy fuck this game is awesome, about 20 or so times during my playthrough. But I guarantee you that every time I uttered those words was because I was getting something from that game that I just don't get from modern isometric CRPGs. Or at least, I don't get it in the same quantity, or quality, or style as I did in Baldur's Gate 2. And I am pretty sure I am not alone in this. In fact, I think that is why there's a legion of people out there who keep coming back to Baldur's Gate 2. And I'm not talking about just some old farts stuck in the old ways. I'm talking about people who go back to Baldur's Gate 2 after they have finished playing The Pillars of Eternities, The Pathfinders, The Age of Decadences, etc. Now, there is a lot to like about these new games. User experience, graphics, sound effects and mix, oh god, especially sound effects and mix. All these things have come a long way in the last 20 years. And on the combat end of things, well, it is a lot more intuitive and the learning curve is a lot less steep than it used to be, even in D&D games. 5th edition rules, for example, are almost foolproof if you compare them to advanced 2nd edition D&D and its infamous to hit armor class zero bullshit. I bet no one's nostalgic about that piece of shit. Solasta's expansion pack, for example, is very challenging, but its challenge is all about figuring out the fight, not its rules. True, those who've played other D&D games will have an advantage in this game compared to those who haven't, but I think those who have never touched a D&D game before won't be at a complete loss not knowing what the fuck to do, like they probably would if they tried to get into the first two Baldur's Gate or Icewind Dale games today. But that doesn't make Solasta better than Baldur's Gate 2, it makes it more user friendly, it makes it less gatekeepy for new gamers I suppose, but that doesn't mean better. It may be part of your idea of better, but I know a lot of old timers who hate 5th edition D&D, they say it is excessively dumbed down and handholdy. Again, different strokes for different folks man. Now when I played Pillars of Eternity, I loved the initial stretch of the game. I fell in love with the world's lore, and I really like how on the combat end of things, the game seemed to favor sound tactical decision making over knowledge of your enemy's strengths and weaknesses beforehand. But for a game that tried hard to appeal to Baldur's Gate fans, 
I think there were many things they forgot to pack. And that goes for many other modern day CRPGs. I'll try to list these things to the best of my abilities, and of course, you don't have to agree with this. If I say my favorite food is tacos al pastor, even if you explain how much better a cheddar fondue is, it won't change my mind about it. So these are the things that Baldur's Gate 2 gave me, me, Alex, that no longer seem to be a part of the package in modern day CRPGs, except rare exceptions. First, most dungeons, NPCs, and quest lines aren't mandatory as part of your adventure's critical path, unless you choose to make them so. Take for example the DRNE's hold location. You may choose to completely ignore that huge castle in the middle of the map, or you may choose to go there because you fit squarely into the treasure hunter archetype of gamers, and you just can't resist the temptation of an unexplored location on a map. Or you may go there because Nalia asked you to. And if that's the case, you may or may not bring her along with you. But if you do, she'll point you in the direction of a secret entrance into the castle. She'll have something to say about some of the areas inside the hold, and she'll even have a conversation with some of the NPCs inside. And if you visit this location with Nalia and claim the place in her name, and if you have the appropriate class, you may choose to become the Lord Protector of the Estate and turn it into your stronghold. And claiming the estate in Nalia's name triggers her very lengthy personal quest. Now you may say that games like those of the Elder Scrolls series also have plenty of locations that you don't have to go to and NPCs that you don't have to talk to or even meet. And you can discover some of these places just by running around the world of Morrowind or Skyrim. And yes, you'd be right, but these places and people feel like they are completely detached from your adventure. And this is in part because your companions and NPCs in these games, well, suck. Your companions are pack mules and combat bots, nothing more. At no point in any of these games do any of these characters make you feel like you've been through a lot together. Actually, if anything, it feels like they couldn't give less of a shit about anything. But in Baldur's Gate 2, choosing to visit the DRNE stronghold as part of Nalia's quest, or the Planner's Fear because you want to help Baligar Korthala, or the Druid's Grove with Cerned, and then keeping these guys around for the remainder of the adventure, will change things completely for the rest of the game. When you have no choice but to press on to escape that hellish asylum, when you survive the Githyanki ambush by the skin of your teeth, when you are left with no choice but to brave the Underdark, it's these guys and gals who are there for you. They truly have become your friends over the course of the adventure, and they have because you were there for them and went well out of your way to help them. You helped Cern make amends with his child, you helped Nalia get her family's keep back and get rid of that prick Ronal, and in most of those cases, you had to go to huge non-mandatory dungeons to do so. And Bioware, because they were the absolute masters of the game when it came to companions in video games, put a nice little laser around the package when you were about to descend into Irenicus' lair by having each of your companions give you one last little speech before the final battle. And this last little speech, or the many interventions your companions have throughout the game, would have not felt the same if you had not had to brave this huge non-mandatory dungeons to help them out. And this takes us neatly along to the second point I wish to make. Your companions' quests are long and beefy. They often intersect with your main mission and other side quests, and they are loaded with ifs. And player-dependent ifs are the single thing I look forward to the most in an RPG. It doesn't have to be the thing you look forward to the most, but if it is, you just gotta love Baldur's Gate 2. Okay, so getting rid of the demon of drama leak was pretty fucking awesome, I'll give it that. Especially since the whole deal makes several parts of that game play out significantly differently, depending on whether you play as Losa, or if you have her as one of your companions in Divinity Original Sin 2 or Alistair being King Merrick's son and the impact this has on the main story in Dragon Age Origins, and even the quest that requires you to help Augur and find Branca. These are good examples of games that manage to intertwine your companions' stories with your main mission. But those are exceptions rather than the rule these days. And even if you take into account these exceptions, I still think Baldur's Gate 2 did it better. Way better, actually. Because your companions in Baldur's Gate 2 often have more than one quest. These quests also involve a full cast of NPCs and important factions in the game's lore. They span over many days, and they are filled with ifs. 
Even the loot you get depends on details like whether or not you're romancing the NPC in question, or if you have the right reputation with this or that faction. Take for example Jahaira's quest with the Harpers. This quest becomes available after you investigate Monteron's disappearance at Zar's request. And this quest also has its fair share of ifs. If you don't wear the Harper's amulet when you enter the second floor in Harper's Hold, while you're investigating why Monteron has gone missing, you'll be attacked by some weird-ass Harpist ghosts. But if you do, they'll let you be and they'll even answer your questions. At some point in this quest, you return to Zar with a bird who is supposed to be a cursed Monteron. So in order to remove the curse, Zar performs a reverse polymorph on the dude. But surprise surprise, turns out the bird wasn't Monteron, but a Harper agent named Lucette, who's been tasked with a mission to kill Zar, which she proceeds to do almost immediately. When that happens, you may choose to stand idly by and do nothing, and I can see why you would do that, because let's face it, Tsar and Monteron might have been your first companions in the original Baldur's Gate. After emoing, yes, before the actually crowd corrects me. But they were assholes. Arrogant assholes, both of them. So if you let Lucette kill Tsar, and if Jahaira is with you, she'll have a few words to mince with Lucette, and immediately after, some NPC will show up at the scene and request Jahaira's presence at the Harper stronghold. But if you kill Lucette before she talks to the party, then you simply won't get Jahaira's companion quest at all. But if you do get the quest, get ready for a multi-stage questline filled with dramatic tension, unexpected combat encounters, and lots and lots of ifs. For example, at some point in this questline, you run into a Harper agent who questions Jahaira about the events that took place at Harper Hold, also known as you butchered the Harper leader of the city. If you have enough reputation and choose your words carefully, you may avoid confrontation. If you don't, you'll have to engage the agent and his pals in battle. And if this happens in a populated area, even the local militia may become involved. And if one of them happens to die, you become a wanted criminal in the city. And this has consequences. There are also dialogue options in this questline that may result in Jahaira leaving the party for good and the quest ending abruptly. But you may also seize the opportunity to strengthen your bond with her and progress further into the romance if you have decided to romance her. And near the end of Jahaira's quest, she takes the reins of the conversation with this Harper NPC who wants to get to the bottom of things. This conversation marks the end of that lengthy questline and brings closure to Jahaira's quarrel with the Harpers. Now, depending on your reputation and whether or not you have been romancing Jahaira, you may get a shitload of experience or a badass Harper pin or both of these things or none of them. I think it's also worth mentioning that Jahaira ends up renouncing the Harpers, an organization she had been a part of for decades because she saw the leader of the organization and some of the other Harpers in the city for who they truly were. And at some point, because you became involved trying to protect her, she had to choose sides and decided to stand with you. If that doesn't make you feel like you and Jahaira have been through a lot by the end of the game, I don't know what will. And this is just one of two quests she has in the game. The other quest may even result in her death if you don't get it done quickly enough. Compare this to your companions' quest in Pillars of Eternity, which I love, again. Your companions' missions in Pillars of Eternity, for example, consist of just two or three events at most. The loot and experience you get does not change depending on the type of relationship you have with the character or your reputation with any of the factions, and they rarely involve any of the big players in the game. Also note that Jahaira's companion quest only becomes available after you're done investigating Monteron's death. This is important because this quest has you meddling with Harper affairs and the result is that you'll get a pretty good idea of what the Harpers are like and what they are capable of doing, and you experience this first hand. In Liliana's companion quest in Dragon Age Origins, for example, you know who Marjolaine and the Orlesian assassins are because Liliana tells you all about them herself. You have no prior dealings or experience with these people and you're only interested in them because they are trying to kill your friend or love interest. Bioware later rolled out the whole story about Liliana's past as a DLC and I can't help but think that if Baldur's Gate 2 had been made 10 years later, we probably would have had to buy Jahaira's companion quest separately as a DLC or something. 3. Baldur's Gate 2 strikes the perfect balance between opportunity cost and freedom. Every location in Pillars of Eternity, for example, with a few exceptions, seem to be locations that you absolutely have to go to because the story demands it. 
and many of these locations can only be visited if, or rather once, you have a reason to go there. Now that was fixed in the second game to some extent with all the freedom you have to move around the Deadfire Archipelago, and don't get me wrong, that's absolutely awesome, but most of the dungeons and ruins that you can go to in that game are frustratingly short. You can forget about dungeons like Fearcrock's Maze in Baldur's Gate 2. But like we mentioned, the best thing about these huge dungeons in Baldur's Gate 2 is that most of them aren't really mandatory, and that, my friends, is what I call freedom. There's also, of course, the fact that you can kill any NPC you want, you can walk about in bear form if you're a druid all day long if you wish, even outside combat, and you can brute force your way through most quests if you don't like the narrative options, amongst many other things. But opportunity cost is every bit as important as freedom in an RPG. Games like the original Fallout thrived on the replay value that came from your decisions. You had to think long and hard before doing anything in that game, because just about every decision opened up a door and closed another one. At the end of the game, you get a lengthy succession of stills documenting the outcome of your actions, just like you do in every RPG worth its salt these days. But if you want to save your vault and every other location from the mutant invasion, but you also want to know what would have happened if you had cooperated with the mutants, well, you'll have to play the game twice. And almost from scratch. Oh, so you happened to accidentally kill a few citizens in Junktown and became a wanted man? Well, I guess if you want to see what that town had in stock for you in terms of quests, you'll have to play it again. And the same thing goes with every other town and faction. Do you take the time to repair the mutants' water processing plant, or do you simply take their water chip and get the hell out of there? And if you decide you want to fix the water processing plant, are you smart enough to fool the mutant at the entrance? Because if you aren't, you'll have to do battle with him, or sneak past him. The bottom line here is that you have to choose, and these decisions come with a hefty cost. You can't experience everything the game has to offer in one go, and that's what makes your decisions valuable. But if you are the kind of guy who obsesses about getting the groceries from your car to your house in one go, well, you'll feel almost at home in Baldur's Gate 2, because the game will give you the chance to go almost everywhere in one playthrough. You can even switch companions and take everyone to the place they are supposed to go to. Not a great plan. No, not a particularly good plan, but you can do this if you want. But there are still some doors that will open or close, narratively speaking that is, depending on whether you go for the good or the evil approach. Some good companions, for example, just can't get along with the evil ones, to the point that some of them will just leave your party if you do things that conflict too much with their alignments. They may even end up siding with your enemies and fighting against you in some cases. And there are some places that you just can't get into if you don't do things in a certain way. During my first two playthroughs, for example, I just couldn't find a way to get into one of the biggest buildings in the Athkatla Bridge district, although it was pretty obvious that this was one building that you could get into. Turns out you had to have Anoman in your party and you had to agree to do his father's bidding. But the first time I played the game, I just didn't care about Anoman and never recruited him into my party, like, ever. And the second time I played the game, though I did bring him into my party and even started his companion quest, I ended up talking him out of killing his father's rival Farad because I felt like the old man was just being resentful and he didn't have any solid evidence to prove that the dude had actually killed Anamon's sister. So that time, because he let the authorities take care of the issue, his father disowned him, the old bastard, but he was accepted into the Order of Knights later on. But the third time I played the game, I finally got into Farad's estate in the Avkatla Bridge district and butchered the man there and then. This time Anaman's father was happy with the deed, but the Order of Knights rejected him later on in the game. And if I remember correctly, I missed out on a shitload of experience points. And I hear that there is a way for you to kill Farad and still get Anoman to be welcomed into the Knight's Order. I'm sure the actually crowd will have something to say about this. But those are still three different outcomes that you can't experience in one playthrough. Plus, it goes without saying, you'll only know about this quest if you bring Anoman with you. Also, after you escape the asylum in the island of Brynlaw, you are faced with arguably the most impactful decision that you're going to make in the entire game. You can either take the portal directly to the Underdark, or you can go back to the city and talk to that scoundrel Simon Havarian to see if he can get you out of there by less life-threatening means. If you choose this second path, there is a huge succession of quests and locations that in my opinion are the best part of the entire game. And they are hiding behind an if. You just gotta love that man. 
Commenter Ryan C had this to say about that. Holy crap, I've played that game many times over the last 22 years and I've never gone through the Githyanki quest path. I always went to the Underdark. And this is something that you very rarely get to see in games these days. See, as much as I like Pillars, I've played that game three times and every time I've visited the same locations in almost the exact same order because there aren't any branching paths like the one I just mentioned. Yes, the second game changes that for the better, like the many ways in which you can deal with Benwith, or the slavers, or the factions, but none of that comes close to that single decision note in Baldur's Gate 2. That one has you going to different locations, meeting different people, etc. And none of that happens in Pillars 2. There are two examples, in my opinion, that come close in modern gaming. One of them is the Yoreth or Roche decision in The Witcher 2. This decision changes the game completely, and it's easily the most impactful decision I've ever made in a game. But again, this is impressive because it is exceptional. Another exception would be the secret ending in Pathfinder Kingmaker, which entails an entire new chapter and one of the toughest fights there have ever been in a CRPG. Also, in my review of Baldur's Gate 2, I made the huge mistake to say that there was not one, but three different places that you could claim as your stronghold. And I have heard no end to the actually crowd correcting me about this one for more than a year. What's funny about this is that not even the actually crowd seem to agree on this. Some say there are five strongholds, others say that there are seven, and someone recently say that there were eight different strongholds in the game. Imagine that. I played the game three times and discovered three different strongholds and in my ignorance I thought that was all of them. But that just goes to show that there is a huge amount of content in this game that may be experienced in different ways depending on your class and on your decision story wise. But the best part is that the game does not prevent you from going to the locations in which these events take place. Because at the end of the day, these locations are simply there. I really like Tyranny, for example, and I think its myriad of branching story paths is second only to Fallout New Vegas. But the game does hide some of the locations in which those story events that aren't part of the path you choose take place. And well, as old as it is, Baldur's Gate 2 does this one thing that others don't anymore. But there is more. 4. Dungeons aren't linear, but they are also not unnecessarily labyrinthian. This is not unique to Baldur's Gate 2, of course. Solasta's expansion pack, The Lost Valley, which came out last year, has some pretty impressive and incredibly immersive dungeons. The Temple of Elemental Evil is also a very good example if you want to look at other games that came out two decades ago. And the Dwarven Ruin in the Troll Wilderness in Pathfinder Kingmaker is also a good example, even if I wasn't crazy about that game. But there are many more games that just half-ass their dungeons these days. I'd take the dungeons in Baldur's Gate 2 any day over 70% of the dungeons that we are seeing in RPGs these days. 5. You get 16 companions, 21 if we talk about the Enhanced Edition, and they are awesome. I know the actually crowd will probably come on and say there's this or that other companion that I am missing because yada yada. But the point is that you don't usually get these many companions in modern day CRPGs. And I'm not talking about your typical half-ass tagalongs like the ones you get in Skyrim. I'm talking about people with clearly defined and multi-layered personalities. People who will react favorably or angrily to your actions to the point that they may end up leaving your party or even taking sides with your enemies if your actions strike them as excessively dishonorable or honorable depending on who you side with. I'm talking about people whose favor you earn by getting involved with complex lengthy personal quests like the ones we've mentioned earlier. I'm talking about people whose lives do not revolve around your mission and can have conversations like this with each other. So Nalia, saved any poor from their impoverished status lately? Your concerns for those in destitute poverty, something you would have little insight into, is rather charming. Perhaps that peculiar urgency of yours could be put to better use, passing out to noon meats to vagabonds and coins of the realm to every cut purse, hmm? Viconia, it's simply a matter of even distribution of goods. There are those whose consumption is a crime against nature, and that injustice should be corrected whenever possible. Your egalitarian streak is an affront to determinism. The poor remain poor because they are lacking in the self-will and determination to seek higher stations. Your pity and endowments only serve to perpetuate their condition and diminish their motivation to improve their lot. 
My kinship with the disenfranchised is my own affair, Viconia. To deny the need to help our fellows is cruel arrogance, and I am simply not that kind of person. That bleeding heart of yours must cost you a small fortune in laundering, child. You are adrift in denial. <laughs> I can see why you guys like Viconia. I know there are many games that have companions that are every bit as good as these. Better than these, even. And then there are some others that have more companions. What you don't see nowadays is games in which there are these many companions with these many scripted interactions that aren't painfully cringy, that is. Although I do have to give credit to those who try. All in all, we don't revisit Baldur's Gate 2 every X number of years out of pure nostalgia. We revisit this timeless classic because it has stuff to offer that newer games do not. That's not to say that we don't appreciate the combat in Divinity Original Sin 2 or Solasta. That's not to say that we weren't thrilled with characters like Durin's Adair or Eloth in Pillars of Eternity. That's not to say that we didn't collab DiCaprio style in The Wolf of Wall Street with the itemization in Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. It doesn't mean that we don't find the concept behind Kaesi's character in Pathfinder Kingmaker awesome. We are not denying that we got goosebumps with the crescendo of the scripted event in Pillars of Eternity's White March Part 2 expansion, or that we were sucked into the world of Age of Decadence because of its brilliant writing. Commenter Adrian Franco had this to say, I got Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 a few years ago, and I've put hundreds of hours into them. This goes to show that it's not that people look at these games through rose-tinted glasses of nostalgia, and modern games need more than just good graphics to compete. And I can definitely relate to this. I picked up Icewind Dale 2 a couple of years ago, and I admit that I hadn't played it before. But that's because I wasn't crazy about the first game back in the day. And I was blown away. I really couldn't believe how good it was. But Adrian Franco says that modern games need more than just good graphics to compete. And to be fair, we've seen massive improvements in lots of other respects over the last 20 years, not just graphics. There's been a quantum leap in quality on the sound effects and mix end of things. So much so, in fact, that even half-hearted run-of-the-mill CRPGs like Black Geyser are vastly superior to our beloved classics in this respect. There have also been innumerable improvements in user experience and quality of life features, which is not to be confused with hand-holiness. Comparing items vis-a-vis -vis wasn't something you could do back in the day, and even an old fuck like me goes, of course, when he picks up a CRPG that he missed from the early 2000s for the first time in the 2020s and has to deal with not being able to compare items. And that auto-sort inventory button that you get these days, and the many different sorting filters, now that's something that I am inversely nostalgic about when I revisit my favorite classics. But there is no denying that many of the good things that we got from games like Baldur's Gate 2, Fallout, and Arcanum are no longer a part of a plan these days for most developers, because it seems like they tend to focus more on the experience they want to deliver, and less on paving the multiple roads that we, the players, may choose to travel as we try to do things our way. I think this is also a good time to address the elephant in the room, or the donkeys in the room. There's like problems with just freaking starting this up, and you still want to tell me that a 1080p Xbox One is worse than this game. Get out of here. That's cool and all, but, I mean, it's kind of outdated now, so, I mean, gotta let go of the past here. Now listen here, you little shit. Do you think your precious Xbox came out of a fucking tree? Do you think someone just sat down and pulled every idea that went into the making of that console out of his ass? You think your beloved quarter pounder with buttons was an original idea that someone just farted out while he was balancing on a hammock? Because I wouldn't be surprised in the slightest if you did. Juvenoia, the fear or hostility directed by an older generation toward a younger one, or toward youth culture in general. No, 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 Spender, that's not what's happening here. I think some of these kids are actually pretty cool. Oh dang, you've done good! This is where it all started, it's all thanks to this! I would still have so much fun playing this, playing all the old games. Console-wise, probably worse, but I see some of these games and I'm like, I want to be playing this. The thing is that there wouldn't have been a freaking Xbox or PlayStation in the first place if the NES hadn't come out in the mid-80s. The knowledge that went into the making of the NES is embedded within every console that has come out ever since, either technically or in concept. Cool and all, but, I mean, it's kind of outdated now, so, I mean, gotta let go of the past here. 
If the people who made these consoles had had this retarded philosophy, you'd be talking with your friends about the high score you got in Sequest for the Atari 2600. And it is the same with games. Every time anyone compares Pillars of Eternity, Pathfinder, or any other game to Baldur's Gate 2 using it's better than, it's worse than, I lose a little bit of faith in humanity. See, just as it happens with consoles, when you play a relatively new game like Pillars of Eternity as a newcomer to medieval CRPGs, a lot of what you get are the concepts, design decisions, and creative choices that went into making Baldur's Gate 2. They have just been used as the foundation for a newer game. They weren't created for this newer game by the people who made it, as competent as these people used to be. Raedric's whole questline, for example. That's just Nalia's questline to reclaim the Dearnese estate with a different makeup. Vithrax? They are Illithids by a different name. Shoribs? They are Svarts by a different name. The Dock District in Pillars is almost a carbon copy of the Dock District in Baldur's Gate 2. Doesn't anyone notice this? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills! And again, that's not to say that there aren't any new ideas and concepts in these new games. In fact, I prefer the way in which Pillars handled its character creation and its skills. No need to insult me in the comment section, by the way. I really liked the concept of the Orleans and the Godlike as a race. I also thought it was a very smart decision from a narrative perspective to provide the game with an all-encompassing crisis like the one of the Hollowborn, which affected everyone in the world, as opposed to Baldur's Gate 2's world in which people only have their personal dilemmas to worry about and seem oblivious to what's going on with Irenicus. And rightly so, because he's only really a threat to you and to the elves of Soldan Esselar. I guess the most important takeaway here is that I mean, gotta let go of the past here. This is not our path forward. It's a trap! This is how we wipe out things that should be preserved. To put it bluntly and mundanely, we want those new item comparison features. We want those single-click inventory sorting mechanics. We want those filters and search bars that make our lives easier today. We want our contextual automated lockpicking click. We want our automated trap detection upon entering stealth mode. We want the cinematic quality and the best sound mix we can get. But we don't want opportunity cost to be erased from our RPGs. We don't want our freedom to be replaced by games of smoke and mirrors. We don't want decisions to be taken away from us. And those who are on the production end of things in the world of entertainment would be very foolish to label the entire community of Baldur's Gate fans as obsolete old farts who are stuck in the old ways. I for one am glad to see that some developers out there have not forgotten about what's important for people like us. And one can only hope they will continue to be awesome in the future. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, thank you for watching all the way up until now. If you like what you are seeing in this channel, please consider subscribing and clicking that notification bell to avoid the usual YouTube shenanigans. Share the video, but most importantly, never stop gaming. But don't let gaming get in the way of your hopes and dreams. Bye, everyone.